Hello friends, how are you? My name is Ari Theriger and today I'm going to talk about the first Icelandic settlers. I'm not going to focus on the first peoples to inhabit Iceland such as the Irish. I'm going to develop this video around the first Scandinavians who settled in Iceland and made it their new home. The ancestors of the modern Icelanders who fled from Norway due to political and religious pressure and persecution. By the way, uh, I hope you have enjoyed the music in the introduction. Uh, this time it wasn't me, it's from Sigurbody Gettarsson and he allowed me to use one of his compositions. Uh, he's a musician and also works for Dunheim, another great band of atmospheric dark folk music. I'll leave down below in the description uh, the link to his YouTube channel as well as to Danaheims. This is the very first video of 2019 and I thought it would be interesting to speak about uh, this subject since it was an event that marked the beginning of a new life for thousands of Scandinavians who built a fantastical society and due to their detachment from the mainland and to a certain extent their isolation Many of the old traditions were kept and thanks to these settlers, many written sources about the old pagan traditions remained very much alive. Which is why nowadays Iceland is the only European country which has a much easier acceptance and easily continues to practice pre-Christian pagan traditions than any other European country. Sometimes we speak about the people of the past as individuals with a great temporal distance and they are no more than nameless shadows and they seem so strange to us or even fantastical creatures of old. So on this video I want you to know about these first Icelandic settlers because they had names, they had lives, they weren't better or worse than you or I they were just people, normal people with very different backgrounds and ideas and I want you to know them so you can feel closer to them and understand that those people were very much like us nowadays with their own fears, struggles, passions. We nowadays aren't much different from our ancestors. We are all trying to live this life as best as we can. We are all trying to survive Times change, but people are all the same. Let's start this video. Before I start giving out the names of some of the first settlers and their background history, I shall give you a little background context of the colonization of Iceland. Aside from the few Irish settlements of Christian monks, Iceland was generally unpopulated and during the later decades of the 9th century, an important wave of Norwegians, along with their Celtic thralls, paid workers, not slaves, settled for the first time and began to colonize the island. These Norwegians were seeking political and religious freedom due to the monarchical onslaught of King Haraldr Hölfarga, Fair Hair. King Harald was still a pagan, but under the influence of Christian Europe, he set a new objective for his reign, to conquer all of Norway and bring it under a Christian-style monarchy. This led many Norwegians to flee into a remote place where they could settle a form of social order deeply rooted in their native heritage. There was never a king in Iceland, uh, the land was ruled by local priest chieftains, Godar. Setting up meetings was here in the Hölting, an assembly or early stages of what resembled a parliament, to settle all sorts of legal cases and other affairs of state. As you might imagine, this form of government uh, didn't have much impact on this massive island, uh, it was minimal when it came to exercising authority. So to a certain extent there was a lot of freedom in every kind of field. 
The great majority of the first Icelanders practiced the religion they brought with them, uh, the so-called uh, polytheistic Norse heathenism, which by all means was a religion that allowed for as much individual freedom as the Icelandic system of government itself. This means that the first Icelanders originally tolerated all the religious differences. A person could worship Huden, while another would worship Freyr, and some would be fully Christians or have a religion which was a mixture between the pagan and the Catholic, or even have no religion at all. I think this is important to retain. Uh, the first Icelanders weren't just Norse heathens. Uh, it was a big cocktail of religious and racial differences. But what is important to remember is that these people fled practically into an unknown land and had to start their lives from the beginning, adapt to the new circumstances and new landscape. After much struggle, they combined their strength and their wisdom and together made an outstanding society, one that nowadays other European countries should look at and take as an outstanding example of what happens when people unite under a single objective for the entire benefit of the community. So now let's meet some of the first Icelanders and their stories. Let's start with a man named Floki uh, to understand the religious background performed before Norwegians started their adventure into Iceland. Floki was a godi, a priest chieftain of the old religion. He conducted a, a great religious ceremony back in Norway, a blot. He hallowed three ravens which would show him the way seafarers had to take to find their new home. A cairn was built where the sacrifice had, had been and it was called Flokavarda, the cairn of Floki. The cairn was built somewhere in the southwestern coast of Norway. We only have indications that it was built between the counties of Hordaland and Rogaland. After the sacrifice and hallowing the three ravens, he sailed out to sea. While at sea, he let off the ravens. The first raven flew backwards, the second up into the air and back to the ship, smart one and the third forward in the direction of land. Thus, Floki eventually reached Iceland, most likely not alone, but with the following people I shall mention. There were a number of first settlers that carried with them an important symbol of the Old Norse religion, the pillars of the high seat of their previous halls or temples, the Onvegislur. These pillars are the remnants of an ancient Indo-European tradition around the cult of the central pillar, one single wooden beam which marked the center of the spirituality of prehistoric peoples. We have a couple of examples, such as the central pillar of the house, which was the symbol of the world axis or world tree, a single wooden beam in the middle of the prehistoric settlement, with the images of the gods carved and the stories of the community as we find in prehistoric archaeology, mostly of Eastern Europe. The very concept of Irminsul, the central pillar of the Germanic faith, etc. This ancient Indo-European cult around the central pillar was kept in pre-Christian Scandinavia in the form of the pillars of the high seat of a great hall or a temple. And whenever people wanted to settle in a different place, they would take these pillars with them and place them in the new land. Most of these symbols had the gods or a specific god carved on them, so they carried with it the religious heritage of a people. In the case of the first Icelanders, upon coming near land, they threw overboard the on Vegislur, the pillars of the high seat, and wherever these washed ashore, they would settle in there. 
in the symbolic action of letting the gods decide where they should settle. Uh, let the spirits of the sea carry the pillars into a place where they deemed it would be a good spot for the newcomers to settle. Because throughout the history of Iceland, even to this day, most Icelanders didn't simply settle where they choose. They have always had a great respect for the Landvethir, the spirits of the land. And so they would only settle where the Landvethir would let them, to avoid disturbing the land spirits and later on have troubles with the local spirits, or to be more precise, having troubles with Menvethir, which happened according to the Icelandic folklore and even within the historical accounts of the colonization of Iceland. In these accounts of the first people to settle in Iceland, some of the pillars were carved with the image of Hur, but not everyone would follow the pillars and settle where they landed. For instance, Kveldulf died on the voyage, and before he died, he ordered that his coffin should be thrown overboard in sight of land, so that his son Grim would settle where the coffin landed. Along with Floki, the dead Kveldulf and his son Grim, there were other men, Thorolf, Monskerskeg, Ingolf, Lonmond, Thorskegi, and Rolaug. These were the names of the very first to settle in Iceland, or at least the first names to be registered. Now, I have chosen a couple of examples of Icelanders and their religions, so you might have a quick panorama of the religious background of Iceland, which was very diverse. There was a woman named Aud the Wealthy, uh, and apparently very famous back then, for reasons I could not find, unfortunately. Aud was a Christian woman who lived in a place surrounded by small hills, knolls. She had crosses all over the place because she was baptized and made sure to hallow her land with the sign of the cross. She was bur buried on consecrated earth as she had wished and their wish was carried out with great respect because these people were civilized. Thereafter, her kinsfolk had great faith in the small hills and so an altar, Orgre, was raised there for sacrificing. Her kinsfolk believed that after death they would pass on into the small hills and reside there. There was a man called Horolf. He made his home on a large portion of land around a great hill in Western Iceland. He had so much faith in that hill that he believed that upon death he would reside there. And so he called it Helgafell, the famous hill to where the dead in Iceland would go and reside in great hills. He stated that no man would be allowed to look on it unwashed. And the great hill became a sanctuary and it wasn't allowed for any man or beast to arm or, or to do harm on anything. In that region, Helgalfell became sacred ground. Thorolf and his kinsmen believed that they would pass into the hill after death. This is the same Thorolf who came on the ship with Floki and the others. And uh, this was the land where his pillar carved with the image of Thur had landed. Thorolf made the district thing in this place, uh, the local assembly and decreed that no one was allowed to relieve himself on this area. There was a specific area for this kind of mess, but not in there, because Thorolf and his kinsmen believed that such impure acts would defile the sacred ground, and that this defilement drove away the local elves. After Thorolf's death, uh, things changed and people from outside started to disrespect the district laws. The kinsmen of Thorolf would not have this, so they fought against the others, and some were killed and others wounded but spared. But with this bloodshed, the place was made unhallowed with the blood of vengeance. Thorkel, Moni, the law speaker, during his last illness, he made them carry him out uh, into the sunlight and commanded himself to the god who had shaped the sun. It's not specific what god is this. We know that 
in the Norse, uh, to the Norse, uh, in the Norse mythology. The sun was female, the goddess Sol, or Suna. Uh, a god who made the sun most likely was a reference to Thir, or maybe Thorkel practiced an old religion forgotten with his death. Helgi uh, went to Iceland with his wife, children, and his son-in-law, Holmund Helskin. Their religion was rather mixed. Um, they believed in Christ, but often called on Thur for seafaring and other adventurous acts. Thorhad was a temple priest back in Norway. When he decided to go to Iceland, he took down the temple and carried with him the temple earth and the pillars. The same religious and symbolical act uh, we have seen previously. When he settled in Iceland uh, in Stolafjörð, he laid the sanctuary on the area and the temple earth all over his land and allowed nothing to be killed in the area except home cattle. A man named Hol and his father Helgi both were called the godless. Father and son would not worship or sacrifice because they trusted in their own might. This is the concept of Mothr og Megin which denotes somebody trusting solely in his own might and strength, only in himself or herself, and not in the gods and other supernatural powers. There was a man called Grib, who was worshipped after death on account of his popularity. Hulstein sacrificed quite often to the god Thur, and he even gave his son for that purpose. Yes, he sacrificed his own son. Geir was a man often called the Geir, meaning Sanctuary Geir, because he was a great blotman or blotmother, and all his children were called by names beginning with the Sanctuary. There was another great blotman called Thorstein Rednose. He worshipped the waterfall, and he often threw offerings into the waterfall in his land. A, um, a man said to be very skilled in the art of Forsyth. When he died, all his sheep drove down the waterfall following Thorstein. Kethil, uh, who was a devoted Christian, settled in Iceland. Whatever he did, uh, no heathen was allowed to live in there. After his death, a man named Hildir, who was a heathen, tried to reside in that area, but when he came near the, to the farmyard, he fell down dead. Ketil might have used some strong magic and that's what we are going to talk about next. As previously mentioned, Ketil might have done powerful magic to protect his lands from heathens and Thorstein was very skillful in the art of Forsyth. In the Icelandic sagas, uh, it is frequently mentioned magical arts as practiced by Volvur, witches, or Spokonur and Fjölkynningkornur, wise women or practitioners of magic or magical arts. But we also have references to man, Fjölkynningr, Maltr. The magical art in general was called Fjölkingi or Frodleikr, Leikr meaning to play, so it is to play with wisdom and learning. There are also people referred to as Oskir, someone who possesses the second sight, or people with supernatural strength, Raumahin, and shapeshifters, Hamramra. So, to finalize this video, I have chosen a couple of examples of the first Icelanders who possessed such powers or were regarded as such. There was a woman called Geirith daughter of Belgifort. She practiced witchcraft and was teaching a man named Gunlaug, who died of injury when he was learning magical wisdom from Geirid. Torbjörn, who was the father of the dead man, summoned her and she was charged, not for practicing witchcraft, but for letting her apprentice die. An oath was taken and she stopped her hearts to avoid another innocent death. Lodmund had superhuman strength and he was also a wizard. 
He lived for a time in a place with, uh, while he waited for his whole pillars to wash ashore. When he finally had news of where the, his pillars had settled, he put his possessions on his ship and set sail on uh, to his new, ho new home. In that moment, in the place where he had lived, the land fell upon his old homestead. He put a spell in this land saying that no ship that sailed from that spot would ever escape, escape safe from the sea. His reasons were his own. When he was old, uh, in the land he had settled, he had battles with another wizard called Thrasi. Uh, this Thrasi, by magic, turned a great portion of water towards Lord Moon's lands. So Lord Moon, with his stuff and his spells, managed to turn back the water again. The two wizards spent an awful lot of time turning the water this way and that until they finally came to an agreement and agreed that the water should flow down into the sea without causing any harm. And so a river was formed, Jokul's River, and it separates two districts. Horngeir had two sons, Torgils and Hoth. He went to find his ship and brought his son Thorgils with him. They never returned. Hod went to look after them and found them killed by a white bear who was drinking their blood. Hod killed the bear, brought him home and it is said he consumed the entire bear and thus he avenged his father and brother. But after this everything changed as he became ill-tempered and difficult to deal with. He was changing. He became a shapeshifter, a hammer hammer. He left home and used his new abilities to help his sister who was going to be stoned to death. Nothing more is said about the event, but I like to think Hod uh, hacked to pieces those who were going to stone his sister to death. Dunthak and Storhof Heigason were both shapeshifters. Their account is told by a man with second sight, who saw them shapeshift and come to battle with each other over a land. Dunstag shapeshift into a bull and Storholf into a bear, and both fought fiercely. Both of them were severely injured and came to no agreement. Hate, the witch, predicted that Hingimund and his men should all settle in a land yet to discover west of the sea. The witch told him that a token, a talisman, Hluthre, uh, that had disappeared from his purse would again be found in this new land when he dug the holes for his old pillars. Ingimund didn't want to go to any undiscovered land to find his talisman, but Haid told him he would, could not prevent that from happening. Hingimund just wanted to find the talisman, so he sent two fins in charmed shapes into Iceland where they, where they had found his talisman, but were unable to take it, because they were in charmed shapes, Hamfarir. They gave Hingimund instructions where he would find his talisman. They were quite specific about the landscape of this place. So Hingimund went and settled at Hof in Valdensdal in northern Iceland. Witches, shapeshifters, men with supernatural strength and wizards. Iceland was an awesome playground. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Just a couple of early folk tales from Iceland so you have a better perception of the religious background of Iceland and magical arts. Thank you so much for watching. Happy New Year and see you on the next video. Bye for you.